You know, be the best and you gotta pay a little price. If you want it bad enough, you gotta do a little extra things to get it. Come on, I wanna move quick now. Let's be quick in that line. Let's go, let's move, move. Sultry summer of 73, and his job was to take his team and get them ready to be the best. That's the way to work, that's the way to work. Get ready to be the best. Be the best, you gotta pay the price, Butch. Hey, stride it out now, let's go, let's have a good one. It was a job new Rams head coach Chuck Knox sealed when he told owner Carol Rosenblum he didn't think he could win in the NFL. He knew he could. Chuck Knox was the first blossom in a season to be the winningest harvest in Ram history. For Carol Rosenblum, had traded wisely to get top quarterback John Hadle. And in a shrewd trade with Philadelphia, general manager Don Klosterman acquired Harold Jackson, who stood poised on the precipice of superstardom. New uniforms, crisp and colorful, were unveiled, and the men of the Rams faced the forthcoming season determined to make these colors symbolic of blue first-place ribbons and gold winner's trophies. It was a determination that suffused the entire Rams organization in what promised to be a year of blue, a year of gold. The season opened in Kansas City, where Ram assistant coach Jack Faulkner had scouted extensively. The forewarning paid off as the Chiefs' weaknesses were exploited and Los Angeles ripped in. Just before the half, linebacker Jack Reynolds came up with a type of big play that would characterize the defense all year. Reynolds' interception and return was worth 10 points as it stopped a sure Chiefs field goal while leading to a fire drill score by holder Steve Preece. Tight end Pat Curran, number 88, added another touchdown. John Hadle then fired to number 30, Lawrence McCutcheon, and wrapped up a strong 23-13 opening victory. At home the following week against the rugged Falcons, the Ram defense played what Coach Knox called an almost perfect game. They allowed Atlanta no points and only two first downs. John Hadle, in his second week at the helm, had taken full command under offensive coach Ken Meyer, and he laced the air with long, accurate passes which tied the Atlanta secondary in knots. His stinger to Jack Snow helped put 31 points on the board as the Rams made it two for two. In San Francisco, the Rams flashed to an early lead as first-year man Cullen Bryant raced 93 yards to a touchdown. Lusty defense, gaining in strength and togetherness, thwarted the 49ers scoring game with unrelenting persistence. The running game cracked open the 49er line, and Lawrence McCutcheon blasted through, almost taking the goalpost with him. John Hadle and Harold Jackson were just beginning to fine-tune their partnership, which wrapped up San Francisco 40-20. The 49ers had been division champions for three straight years, but they sensed the Los Angeles power and spirit and knew that the handwriting was on the wall. In Houston, against the lightly regarded Oilers, the Rams were apparently looking ahead to their important meeting with Dallas. The Oilers scored 26 points, but finally the Ram defense surged in and scuttled Houston's hopes. Meanwhile, John Hadle swamped the Oilers with three touchdown strikes as the Rams remained unbeaten 31 to 26.
While Houston had been a moment scare, coming up was another Texas twister, a more exacting test for the Los Angeles victory string. In Los Angeles, the tough 40-man Dallas team found one man they couldn't handle. Harold Jackson was about to explode. His seven receptions for 238 yards were augmented by ferocious blocking and fastidious pass pocket protection. day, Harold sped wide open and free, while the Cowboys searched desperately for a way to lasso him, but found none. When Harold scored his fourth touchdown of the first half, it was a proud moment for both him and receiver coach Lee Bennett because it tied the Rams team record. Even more importantly, it gave the Rams a joyous 37-31 victory over one of their toughest opponents and brought their record to 5-0. If it seemed to opponents that the Rams had turned killer, that was just fine. But among themselves, they realized that they had been welded into a cohesive, happy team whose togetherness grew stronger with each week. When Green Bay invaded the Coliseum, all signals were go, and Jack Snow made an excellent end zone grab. Then John Hadle and Harold Jackson kept their game and power glide with another effortless score. But the real story of this game was an all-out assault by number 89, Fred Dreyer. The defensive end set an NFL one-game record by sacking Green Bay quarterbacks twice for safety. Dreyer's four points capped the win, 24-7. The Rams' win streak had been a proving ground, a place where flickering flames had forged the tools of victory. Now as Coach Knox looked back, he could see where each tool had been shaped. In Kansas City, both number 30, Lawrence McCutcheon, and number 45, Jim Bertelson, had raced for over 100 yards, and this type of tandem terrorizing continued throughout the For the year, Jim Bertelson finished among the conference leaders in rushing and punt returns. He's a man whose success is not born so much of style as it is of heart, and whatever there is to give of it, he gives it all. While Bertelson exemplified the fiber of Ram toughness, Lawrence McCutcheon was another reason for backfield coach Dick Vermeil to smile. In only his first year as a starter, McCutcheon broke Dick Bass's team rushing record with 1,097 yards and finished third in the conference despite missing two games with an injury. With 
Bertelson and McCutcheon, the Rams had the best one-two punch in the NFC. What made it so effective was the knockout punch delivered when number 35, Tony Baker, entered the game and ground people to dust. Tony had come in the Philadelphia trade. His style, not fancy. He simply cut a path strewn with bent and crumpled forms. the runners devastated opponents on their way to setting a new team rushing record. In week two, Coach Knox had seen his front four perform to perfection against Atlanta. From that game on, they had exploded pass pockets and ended with 45 quarterback sacks. The fearsome foursome was led by 12-year Pro Bowl selection Merlin Olson at defensive tackle. Merlin's vast experience was a valuable aid to second-year man Larry Brooks, number 90, and the young tackle was a constant backfield interloper. <laughs> Defensive end Jack Youngblood, number 85, in only his third year made the Pro Bowl and put on an outside rush quick all-encompassing and impossible to escape. At the other end position, number 89, Fred Dreyer had torn through the Rams' first six opponents like a hurricane and his free-spirited force went unspent throughout the season. In the fifth week, Chuck Knox had seen another element of the Ram team blossom. Against Dallas, the passing duo of John Hadle and Harold Jackson had unleashed a quartet of lightning bolts that left the Cowboys secondary in shambles. It was a day that every receiver dreams about, and it propelled Harold Jackson to national recognition as a superstar. Harold's performance against the Cowboys was not a one-shot affair because throughout the year he blazed wide open and hung toughly elusive, finishing with 13 touchdown receptions. Double coverage might have been one way to stifle Harold, but with a man like number 84, Jack Snow, as the other flanker, that play was impossible, and some of Harold's success must be attributed to Snow. Through the first six wins, John Hadle had proved to be a magnificent field general. And in week seven, he led the Rams to Minnesota against the Vikings, the only other undefeated team in the NFL. The contest was a ferocious display of physical fireworks. And without Lawrence McCutcheon, the Rams lost 10 to nine, but gave a solid account of themselves. Throughout the season, the Rams' ability to hit was evident. And defensive coach Ray Malavasi often saw his blasters put the wood to the enemy and leave them in splinters. In Atlanta's saucer-shaped stadium, the Rams were still hitting, but lost again, narrowly, 15 to 13. Two losses in a row now made their division lead susceptible to the challenge of the win-streaking Falcons. 
in week nine, the New Orleans Saints came marching in, and the Los Angeles special teams sparkled as they wound their way goalward to set up short, easy scores and a rejuvenating 29-7 win. The special teams contributed greatly throughout the season as number 27, David Ray, led the NFL in scoring. There was speed to spare on kick returns as Al Clark, Bill Drake, Larry Smith, Rob Scribner, and Terry Nelson did their parts. Dave Chappell's punts made the kick coverage teams a study in mayhem as Rich Saul, Bill Olson, Bill Nelson, Rick Kay, Harry Shu, Bob Stein, and number 53, Jim Youngblood, brought the house down. When the arch rival San Francisco 49ers visited the Coliseum, the Ram defense waited patiently, then snuffed out the Niners' last hope for a fourth divisional title. Once again, MVP John Hadle and All-Pro Harold Jackson had a magnificent obsession for touchdowns. Their three hookups rang in the 31-13 victory, but for the 49ers, the ringing was the death knell. They had not won in 12 of their last 13 games with the Rams. While Harold had been great in his flights of fancy scoring, on defense, it was coach Jim Wagstaff's secondary of safety Dave Elmendorf, safety Steve Priest, cornerback Eddie McMillan, and cornerback Charlie Stooks, number 47, who came up with the big plays. Stooks had two interceptions against the 49ers and throughout the season tightly patrolled the corners and also finished among the conference interception leaders. Also starting at cornerback was number 41, Eddie McMillan, who made the NFL all-rookie team. In the deep zones, number 20, Steve Priest. And number 42, Dave Elmendorf, assured that the Rams were rarely stung. In the 11th week, the Rams traveled to New Orleans. And it was the Saints who got stung as Lawrence McCutcheon free wheeled for 152 of the Rams' 340 rushing yards. The passing game clicked as well. John Hadel to number 80, Bob Klein, helped roll up 24 points. On defense, it was the tough, talented linebackers who throttled the Saints with painstaking efficiency. All season long, Coach Tom Catlin's young linebackers were optimum performers. Number 36, Ken Geddes, a first-year starter, blitzed and crunched with fearsome abandon from the outside. Number 64, Jack Reynolds played the middle, and his nickname, Hacksaw, tells only part of it. The other part was his hands, hands like butterfly nets. Number 58, outside linebacker Isaiah Robertson went to the Pro Bowl and was especially tough in the stretch run. For in the last three weeks of the season, Robertson and the Rams figured to be in an all-out fight with the Falcons for the division title. In Chicago, the Rams season turned blue and gold with unexpected suddenness. They had a 9-2 record, but the Falcons were still right on their heels. Lawrence McCutcheon again raced for 152 yards. He set up enough scores, like Les Josephson's, to register 26 Ram points. Then the news came that Atlanta had lost, and a Ram victory meant a title. 
the defense rampaged in and crumbled the Bears, holding them without a point in the entire game. Then it was over. The blue and gold were the uproarious 1973 NFC Western Division champions, and Chuck Knox was coach of the year. Back home in a Monday night game, the Rams could have let down. Instead, they rallied proudly together and picked the Giants apart. Interceptions by Eddie McMillan and Isaiah Robertson brought the game to an early conclusion. The Ram fire continued unquenched, and repeatedly they scorched into the end zone. Number 11, James Harris came in at quarterback, and the Rams continued to roll toward an impressive 40-6 win before a national TV audience. The highlight of the evening was Lawrence McCutcheon's successful bid for a 1,000-yard season. And a lot of the credit goes to offensive line coach Ray Prohaska, while even more goes to the great line of center Ken Iman, guard Joe Chiavelli, tackle John Williams, tackle Charlie Cowan, and guard Tom Mack. All year, these veterans labored in the dust and dirt of the pit, losing few battles while leading the Rams to 11 victories with one game to go. In the last week of the season, the tough Cleveland Browns arrived in Los Angeles on a sunny winter day. The game was one in which all the Ram players contributed to the fullest, just as they had done all year long in leading the NFL in both offense and defense. man the Rams took Cleveland apart 30 to 17 and when it was over they had put together their 12th win an all-time regular season record the following week in Dallas the Cowboys knocked Los Angeles out of the playoffs 27 to 16 but the loss did not tarnish the luster of that joyous day in Chicago where the Rams had built a loom to weave dreams upon a day when the Los Angeles Rams family stood proudly as the NFC Western Division champions. 1973 was a signal season of many team and individual accomplishments, but not one Ram is content with these glories, for owner Carol Rosenblum has pledged continued excellence as the goal. As long as there is one step higher to go, the Los Angeles Rams will strive to take that step, and in the future, there will be many, many, Years of blue, years of gold.